Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. And thanks for watching films this week and supporting the 2020 Princeton Environmental Film Festival virtual edition. So you, we, as you know, we have um, one more day to go the, um, with the festival. You can, can continue to watch films. Go to princetonlibrary.org slash PEFF slash schedule. So we are going to be leaving uh, the chat open during the introductions. And um, so you can continue to use that. Also, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's an ask a question button and you can either ask, that will stay open the entire time. You can ask a question or put in a comment. So uh, let's talk a little bit about today's session. Um, we are very pleased to have filmmaker John Bowermaster and the Watershed Institute Executive Director Jim Waltman here with us today. We're grateful for this opportunity to have them here together so that we can connect you with the knowledge, resources, and work of the people in the Hudson River Valley and also here in central New Jersey. It seems like we have a lot in common. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about them before they appear here on screen. John Bowermaster is a writer, filmmaker, and adventurer, and he's a six-time grantee of the National Geographic Expeditions Council. One of the society's Ocean Heroes, his first assignment for National Geographic magazine was documenting a 3,741 mile crossing of Antarctica by dog sled. John has written 11 books and produced, directed more than 30 documentary films. His feature documentaries include Dear President Obama, Antarctica on the Edge, After the Spill, and Ghost Fleet, which you may have seen uh, last year here in Princeton. His National Geographic sponsored Oceans 8 project took him and his teams around the world by sea kayak over the course of 10 years. That was uh, from 1999 to 2008, bringing back stories from the Aleutian Islands to French Polynesia, Gabon to Tasmania, and more, reporting on how the planet's one ocean and its various coastlines are faring in today's busy world. John lives in New York's Hudson Valley. He is the president of the One Ocean Media Foundation and chairman of, of the advisory board of Adventures and Scientists for Conservation. For the past several years, John and his One Ocean Media Foundation, Ocean 8's film team, have focused on a series of short films about the environmental risks to and hopes for the Hudson River Valley, the birthplace of the American environmental movement. You can find these films and they're free to watch at HudsonRiverStories.com. This is John's first virtual visit to PEFF. He has been here in person, inspiring us with his films and stories almost every year since 2012. John is a, lecture, a visiting lecturer at Bard College in the Environment and Urban Studies Department. Tune into his weekly ra radio show po podcast, The Green Radio Hour with John Bowermaster at radiokingston.org. So let's move over to Jim. Jim Waltman has served as executive director of the Watershed Institute since April, 2005. With more than 30 years of experience in the conservation field, he serves as a go-to resource for government officials and community leaders on how to best protect clean water and the environment through, uh, throughout the region. Jim has led the watershed through a period of strong program expansion and accomplishment. He spearheaded the broadening of the organization's mission and change of its name and brand, as well as the creation of the Watershed Center for Environmental Advocacy, Science and Education, a lead platinum facility that has garnered a number of prominent awards for sustainability and innovation. Prior to joining the watershed, Jim was director of the Refugees and Wildlife Program for the Wilderness Society in Washington, D.C., for 10 years, he represented the Society on Issues Related to the National Wildlife Refuge System, Alaska Public Lands, Endangered Species, and other wildlife matters before Congress, federal agencies, the media, and the public. He spent five years as a wildlife specialist at the National Audubon Society before joining the Wilderness Society. Jim is also a member of the State Agriculture Development Committee, which oversees New Jersey's farmland preservation program and is a founding board member of Rethink Energy NJ, a nonprofit organization that seeks a rapid transition from fossil fuels to clean renewable energy. Jim has a biology degree from Princeton University and a master's 
of Environmental Studies from the Yale School of Environment. So, thank you gentlemen for coming. And uh, at this time, let's bring them on screen, Jamie. Oh, hey Jim. Hi Susan, how are you? Good. Okay, so. So I think um, I think when we hear that sound, it's possible one of us has Crowdcast opened in a second window. So let's all take a look for that real quick so we can get rid of that horrible sound. Um, let me see. Is it me? I don't think it's me. me. John, John, is it you? So now this is like the clue portion of the program. Yeah. Where we find out who's okay. the culprit. I, I can hear you better now. Okay. And we don't hear the horrible sound, so I think it was you. Uh, I'll take the blame. Uh, somebody's got to write that, rewrite that biography, though, man. That was way too long. <laughs> yeah. like you're talking about a really old person. I felt like I was on a marathon there. I know. It was just too much. I, I've told you in the past, you just, I, just need to say, here's John. And I'll, I'll, I'll fill in the I, I can't seem to remember that. But here, here's why I, 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 I um, included so much, because you both have wonderful accomplishments. And I just want all of our participants here today to know that there's lots of things that they can ask you questions about because you've done a lot of stuff and you know a lot of things. So would that be better next? Uh, here's John. He's done a lot and he knows a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, he knows I'll, a I'll write that down. He knows a little about a lot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So why don't we start? Um, let's just start with the films uh, as our beginning point here today. And um, as you can see, we have perfect collusion of ideas for the two of you to uh, jump in and exchange. And I hope to say very little after that long introduction. So, John, tell us about making the Hudson River Stories. What, what's up with that? What's up with that? Well, thank you, Susan. And I'm really sorry not to be there in Princeton. I always I usually do it in the spring, and it's always such a it's often such a beautiful kind of first weekend of spring. And uh, I've always had a great time there. So, hopefully. Uh, 2021 we're planning on it fingers crossed okay um well the the Hudson river stories uh series which now is upwards of 20 short films and by short that they're, they're, they're from five minutes to almost 30 minutes um came about because i i had a good run with national geographic i we literally made films on every continent including two on in, in antarctica and the first 3d film shot in antarctica um and i was traveling a lot uh, but I've lived here in the Hudson Valley for 33 years, and you know, as I as as I wrote and you repeated in my bio there, I, I truly believe that the uh, Hudson Valley or the, the Hudson River is the, was the birthplace of the American environmental movement. I say all the time, I, although I have absolutely no empirical data to back this up, and Jim probably can say the same thing about his backyard. But I think we have more environmental activists per capita here in the Hudson Valley than mm. anywhere in the country. And so, well, obviously, environmental stories are very prominent here, and I knew of them, and uh, I, I thought, well, let's let's put a lot. Initially, it was the risks. We looked at PCBs in the river and the bomb trains and pipelines carrying crude oil down the river, and looked at uh, uh, Indian Point, the leaky nuclear power plant, 35 miles from from Times Square, those kind of things, and. And we made really nice, powerful films that, you know, in some cases actually changed things. We made one of, there was a pr proposal to put, uh, to, to let, allow cargo boats to park on the Hudson River filled with 3 million gallons of crude oil each. And we made a short film kind of describing why we thought that was a really bad idea. And we convinced, uh, you know, communities up and down the river to speak as one against it. And, uh, and that, that the Coast Guard was convinced, so they, they they stopped promoting that idea, which was great. But you know, but you know, those were films about kind of you know dark stories or about risks to the environment. And I showed them around. We fig we figured out a kind of a, a hundred places we could show them around New York State. And I showed them all. I showed them in all the venues, and I got bummed out. So we decided to pivot and and do a series uh, that was more optimistic and more hopeful. And that's where this hope on the Hudson. Uh, idea came from, and the two films that you've shown uh, here this year at the festival, uh, A Living River and Farmscape Ecology, are of that hope on the Hudson series. Um, 
the, the Hudson, despite uh, it, its issues with PCBs, et cetera, still, as, as Jim well knows from his own uh, water sources in there in New Jersey, are filled with life, and you don't always see it. Um, so we thought that was, was this was a good opportunity to uh, to remind people and to show people just how much, especially aquatic life, there is. Although, Jim, you made a good point when we talked earlier, is that, that these are really interesting people. And despite the fact that I am... Uh, or was I think they've kind of eliminated the the title anymore. I was an ocean hero at National Geographic. Uh, my work was always focused on people, and my 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 you know fictitious uh, excuse was that fish can't tell me stories. I need people to share their stories with me, um, and that's what you see in the Living River. And then the farmscape ecology. We we you know we've done a lot of work on the on on the rivers and the watershed, but we've also got a pretty intensely into agriculture because they're both linked water and farming and 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 all impacted by uh, by changing climate etc so it wasn't too big a leap to make uh, some really fun stories about regenerative farming and th those efforts here in the Hudson Valley and the farmscape ecology is, is that it's it's they ask the question can wildlife and 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 nature co or can can farming and and, and wildlife coexist and uh, it's, it's interesting. We learned a lot, especially because we're dealing with scientists. And uh, you know, I'm a journalist. I want an answer right now. I want to, you know, okay, you have, you're going to study this for a year. Well, then tell me what you've learned. And we, they studied it for a year, and we went back and said, okay, tell us what you learned. They said, oh no, it's going to take several more years. We, you know, we can't wait on one year. And, you know, so. Uh, but it was part of the process and part of the give and take, and it was good and and very very beautiful. Um, I think, Susan, you've shown other of our films shot in that same farm, The Seeds of Hope, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and maybe Growing with the Grains, about efforts to yeah, grow yeah. grains and introduce grain to the Hudson Valley, which uh, has been gone for quite a while. But with the boom in, in uh, bakers and brewers and distillers, there's a demand now for, for wheat, which didn't exist previously, so there's more interest in growing grain um, around, around the valley. So. Uh, those are those two films. If you, if, I'm, I'm assuming if you're one of the 40 people who've tuned in, you've watched the films. But if you haven't, you know, check them out because uh, they're they're actually, uh, you know, I, I, we've, I think in the Hudson River Stories series, we've made 20 plus films, and I feel like a proud parent. I, I, I can't really choose which one is my favorite. Although, you know, uh, today I'll tell you it was a Living River, just because you know I can. But tomorrow I'll probably tell you something different. Uh, I like them all. I like them all. Well, what we can do is our, we're, um, so we're done uh, sharing links to films uh, tomorrow, but if for people can still watch the, these two films as well as your other ones for free just by going to your website, which is great. Uh, you know, I really loved in the films, I mean, I thought they were both beautiful. I really loved, um, you know, the scoring, the music in the films was really, really beautiful, John. It was so nice. And, um, but there, there was such a spotlight on different creatures. And I have, I have to say, I, the idea of a sturgeon being 100 to 150 pounds was just mind-boggling to me. Yeah, um, yeah, we went out with the Department of Environmental Conservation and they were tagging the big adult sturgeon, which, as you see in the film, the ones they picked up were caught in the nets that day were six, seven, eight feet long, weighed up to 150 pounds. But it, it's kind of buried a little bit in the, in the film. But there was a guy up there uh, uh, with a sonar uh, helping them find where the the fish were, and he spied that day we were out there filming. He spied a couple of sturgeon on the bottom of the Hudson River that were 14 to 15 feet long, mm. and he said they're very old. You know, they're very smart because they haven't been caught. Yeah. And they, he said, if they had netted one of those things, it would have pulled up, and you wouldn't have been able to wrap your arms around it, and wow. it could have weighed 800 pounds. <laughs> so it's interesting to think these guys—they're very prehistoric looking. Right. You know, and, absolutely. And so, it's a great reminder to know that they're out there, and and if it weighs eight hundred pounds, twenty five percent of it is 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 uh, caviar, row. Yeah. So yeah. So you um and you also mentioned the shad, which the shad um we have um the shad is is uh, also um, spends time in New Jersey, mm -hmm. in Delaware, and we have one of our river towns here, not too, not too far away, Lambertville, which has an annual shad festival every year. So, Jim, if you want to talk a little bit about um, our, yeah, I mean, well, you know about 
You know about all species. A little here. bit about a lot of things. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, Susan, let me just start by um, congratulating you on the festival. Um, like the public library, the Watershed Institute, um, and I should say every nonprofit in the country has been trying to figure out how to how to cope with with COVID. And you've done a really nice job here. Thank you. A great festival together online. So so thank you, and thank you for um, inviting me. Uh, I I love both of John's films, and I told him earlier that I, I felt very much at home watching these films too, because of a, a lot of what's that the stories he's told are things that we've been working on at the watershed. And, and also say, I, I, I love, there's a phrase in there. I don't know if it's a website or something that I caught hope on the Hudson. Um, and I, I just, I think um, you've absolutely have to be uh, a hopeful person. You, you have to be optimistic um, that, uh, that we can, um, improve our behaviors, that we can restore the damage we've done. Um, if you're in my line of work, if you're not an optimist, you can't get out of bed in the morning, right? So I, I'm fortunate through my career and the last 15 years of that at the watershed to see a lot of examples um, that bring me great hope. Um, and typically they have just incredibly uh, passionate people behind them. Um, you mentioned you mentioned the shad, Susan. So. Um, the Shad Run on the Delaware River, um, of course, are storied. Um, there's a, a, a John McPhee wrote a book called The Founding Fish, um, and it's all about the shad. You read that book, you'll know perhaps more about shad than you'll ever ever wanted to. It's an incredibly in-depth, wonderful book. Um, but we've been working at the Watershed Institute to restore shad to the Millstone River. Um, that's Princeton's River. Um, I'll say I grew up in Princeton. I'm embarrassed to say I never learned about the Millstone River. So it's quite possible if you live in Princeton that you don't know about it, but it's worth getting to know. So the, the Millstone forms the western boundary of Princeton and Stony Brook and, Mill, and the Millstone come together at Lake Carnegie. So that's what forms that beautiful body of water at the south end of town. Um, the Millstone once had extraordinary runs of shad um, we know this by some writings from the 18th century, if you can believe it. Um, there was a, a Dutch gentleman that wrote this series of travel logs in, in uh, the colonies. Um, and around uh, what is now the town of Manville, people were telling him stories about uh, once innumerable, innumerable is the word he used, um, uh, swarms, I think he called them, of shad would come up the river. Now this was in the mid uh, 18th century, but by then they were already talking about shad in the past tense uh, because dams had been built at the beginning of the 18th century. So that's, you know, some 300 years ago. So um, what's perhaps one of the most thrilling uh, uh, projects I've worked on in my career is to try to turn the clock back three centuries, um, take out these ancient dams, which have blocked the migration of shad and river herring and striped bass, the fish that you learned about in the film, um, and bring those fish back. And um, two, there, there are three dams, there were, there were four dams that prevented these shad and all these other fish from coming back to Princeton um, and three of those are now gone. So we, we have one more dam we're trying to restore or remove. Um, and the shad already uh, have come further up the river. So the Millstone is one of these strange rivers. It flows from the south to the north, right? There are not a lot of those. Um, so if you're in Princeton, you're kind of midway on the Millstone River. But so the, the and the stories, I'll say earlier in my career, working in the, in the, at the Wilderness Society, I got to know people that were working on um, these decades long dreams of removing these massive dams on some of the Western rivers. Um, and some of those dams are coming back as well. So I, I, I talk about that um, because it's just an example of, of why we can take hope, um, why we can restore things that we, virtually eliminated in some cases. Um, and even right here, 
in central New Jersey, uh, there's there's work we can do uh, to restore the fish. And I, the other thing I want to I, I just wanted to um, say a word about the eel, which are an extraordinary fish. And John, you have some great um, scenes, uh, and and there's a great lesson about eel. Well, um, like most people around here, I've I've uh, I'm walking more. <laughs> since March 13th, which is when we kind of shut down too at the watershed, than I ever had in my life. And I've grown fond of going out at night with a headlamp. And I live in Hopewell Borough. We've got a little park and that's connected to a huge open space. And a branch of, of Beaton Brook comes through that little park. Um, and so I, I can go across the little bridge. You live in Hopewell Borough and you li listen close. So you go across the second bridge with a headlamp around 1030 at night and look down, there is a two foot eel that's been hanging out in that itty bitty stream for, I don't know, the last month at least when I first noticed him. Um, so th th the other thing I wanna uh, leave people with is just there's extraordinary natural phenomenon all around us. And if you open your eyes and you get lucky and you're stubborn at it, stubborn enough to, to persist in your searching, um, you will run across some really extraordinary, enlightening things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's great, Jim. And and uh, the eel story is fantastic. And, and but also the shad. You know, we 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 looked and looked and looked while we were filming that Living River film for shad. Mm -hmm. We didn't see any during the course of an entire summer. So they're here. They're becoming more and more rare here on the, 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 the population. So even as people are removing obstacles to their migration all all up and down the east coast their their population has been um hammered by uh, commercial fishing and water pollution and all these other problems yeah well and and you know we talked previously about the fact that we've made a film about undamming tributaries of the hudson and the film closes with a scene on a, a small creek near troy where they took out a, a first dam and within 24 to 48 hours, the, the creek was filled with, with spawning heron, just filled. Mm -hmm. And John Lipscomb, the river keeper who, point, who was there with us, points out that, you know, th these fish, their, their grandfathers, grandfathers, grandfathers have been coming to that tributary probably for, you know, centuries. And here they are. As soon as that blockade was taken, they, they're, they're mm -hmm. back. And lower down on, the, on, the, uh, on, on the, the Black Creek, which also runs into the Hudson River, they had a, the DEC had put out a counter we are an encounter so they could see how many herring were coming through and we're talking in in a in a, in a spring hundreds of thousands of mm. herring coming in, into this river from the from the atlantic so it it's fascinating but i'll i'll, I'll jump back to your, your nod to hope which obviously i i, I agree with all, we almost have and and you know i i chose that hope on the hudson as kind of the banner for this this group of of films um but it, it and uh, you're right, you have to be, if you're going to do this work, you have to maintain a sense of optimism. Otherwise, you'd stay in bed or jump off a bridge or something. Uh, but I, I drive across the bridges uh, back and forth a lot here in, the, in Ulster County and Columbia County and Dutchess County and, uh, you know, going into Poughkeepsie. I mean, all the bridges across the Hudson River. And I'm as, as beautiful as the Hudson Valley is and changing always because of the clouds and the weather and the and the, the views, et cetera. I, I, it, I, I, that's the first thing I see is the beauty. And the second thing I see is where, where's all the activity? You know, where's all the commercial boating where's, or fishing? Where's all the, and it just doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Uh, the EPA has, you know, and I, I, every time I say this, I hate to say it, but the, the Hudson River is the largest Superfund site in the United States. Uh, because of the PCBs dumped in by General Electric between the 1940s and 1970s, which no one has ever success cleaned up in, in entirety. Uh, long story, but you know, GE did finally get forced to go in and clean up some of it, but then they left too soon before the job was done. And as a result, you, you know, the EPA has come in and, and, and looked at the cleanup, and, and even by the EPA's kind of most optimistic uh, study, we, we, you won't be able to eat safe to safely eat fish that live in the Hudson River. Not those, not the striped bass and the herring that that come in off the Atlantic, but the fish that live there. You're not going to be able to eat them for more than a hundred years from now. 
more than 100 years. And considering that the pollution goes back to the 1970s when they closed the fishery, you're talking about 130, you're talking about three and four generations uh, taken away by that, by, that, that, by that one pollution. So, and as a result, when I say there's no activity, you know, you see, you know, jet skis and sailboats and, mm. and the barges, of course, carrying stuff. But you don't see, imagine if, if that had never happened, you'd have a thriving commercial fishery still on the Hudson, which would be fantastic. All these little towns are starting to, you know, being pushed to develop their economic uh, uh, activities on, on the Hudson. And if there was a, a fisherman population down there too, that would just add to it. Um, so uh, I, I am optimistic, I am hopeful, but you know, there, is, there are these kind of dark stories. The, the other thing I would reference is that, you know, I, I did have this good luck to, to travel around and make films kind of everywhere. But as I uh, got a little older, I realized that you don't have to travel halfway around the world to find good stories and certainly not good environmental stories and not good adventure stories. But as, in each of our own backyards, respectively, there are great stories to be told. So I, we have a long list of films we're going to make here in Nuts Valley still, you know, we go on for, for decades. Um, that said, and Susan referenced it in the introductions, that we did make a film that showed uh, that you showed last year, I believe, called Ghost Fleet, which was a big international feature documentary about the plight of the global plight of fishing slaves. In fact, the most men who work on commercial fishing boats, especially in Southeast Asia, are, are enslaved, and are not, not paid, um, which is heavy. Uh, not, not a, the, the hope there was that we followed a, a Thai woman who's made it her mission in life to find and and return these guys home uh, and she was so full of optimism and hope that you you, you, know, the, the, you, you took away a certain amount of inspiration from the film but uh, we showed it uh, for a couple you played around the world for a couple of years and for the first six months every time I, I watched it I cried because it's so, such a heartbreaking story of these guys who who uh, uh, you know have, some of them have been slaves for a year or two years or five years or ten years one guy for 24 years Years. So, it's, uh, it's, it's, oh, there's oh. a, there's a, hello, hello. Okay, it's fine. So, yeah, it's an incredibly powerful film. We showed it last April on Saturday night at uh, Princeton University. And, you know, you can't, you, you know, crying, weeping, but the, um, the hero of the story totally offsets that to see that there is somebody who, there was nothing for her personally to, to gain by intentionally going into the situation, risking her life. I, be, I believe she was on, might have, she was considered for a Nobel Peace Prize for her yeah, work. Yeah, she was, she was no. on the list. She was on the list, but I, I see that Donald Trump was nominated. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I thought, I, so I do encourage people to watch the food and the, the film. And there's one thing I thought about in watching Farmscape Ecology again is um and it connects to um living river is the idea about knowing where your food comes from and what is on your plate and where it came from which is such a huge message of ghost fleet and what really struck me is the message to that i think that uh we can take from that and i'm sure um jim you talked to people about this is that the intention and the deliberate intention that goes into the kind of work, whether it's in agriculture, all across the board to achieve that. So, um, and the other thing I just wanted to, to bring up is the idea that we saw in films about citizen scientists. And, um, you know, I, I know Jim, you have um, some really, um, was, you know, just checking up on your website before our session today you have um, environmental education programs that serve more than 10,000 children, teens, and adults every year. And, um, you know, so I think it'd be great to talk a little bit about what yeah. we offer here for people to, as we saw in John's film, to actually get involved in things like this. Well, and it was, it was great, John, that you included that element in, in the River film because it is, it is so important. You know, we, we believe as most people in our field do that, you know, children are born with this innate, Rachel Carson called it a sense of wonder. Um, E.O. Wilson, Red Wilson calls it this biophilia, this, this natural affinity to other living things. Um, but we can, we can lose that very easily. Our, our, our culture is not designed 
to feed and nourish those feelings, it's it kind of scrapes them and beats them out of us. So, um, so we've made it a, a big priority for for decades now to uh, try to nourish that, try to sustain that, try to feed that. Um, and you know, some of the people that that come through our education programs will go on to careers in the environmental field, which is wonderful as scientists or advocates or, or educators. Um, but I feel it, it's just as important, if not more so, that that the majority of our society have these opportunities to uh, to have those connections stoked, to fed and nourished. Uh, you know, if if someone falls in love with a bird or or a fish or a tree or a plant. Um, that's that's a magical connection. If you, if it's set up right, it's given enough time, it's given enough air to breathe, and that's a life lifelong thing. Um, I, you know, we're the the watershed's been around long enough. We we've we're more than seventy years old now. <coughs> um, I regularly have people that uh, that talk to me about the experiences they had at the watershed. Um, people who went to our summer camp and now, you know, maybe the, there's one woman I just met her a few weeks ago. She she said she she uh, grew up in Pennington, went to our summer camp, moved away for 30 or 40 years, came back um, and or 20 years, perhaps. And uh, now she's sending her kids to our camp because it made such an impression on her. So, um, you know, the. The hard thing is that, um, you know, there are some parts of our region that uh, have great natural opportunities. Um, if you live in a um, town like Hopewell or, or much of Princeton, we have big open spaces that are the result of decades of people working very diligently to preserve open space. Um, but if you're growing up in some parts of um, the city of Trenton, for example, you don't have as much as much uh, opportunity. So, um, in a kind of newer chapter of the Watershed Institute, we're we're trying to kind of go beyond our traditional geography and and provide a bridge for these natural experiences again to nourish what we think is a is an innate uh, connection to the environment in young people that just haven't haven't had those opportunities. Um, citizen science, you know, is is a is a part of all of this, and um, and it runs the gamut. We're very fortunate. We have some incredible volunteers that help us do our our stream monitoring, our water testing. Um, in I think we're at more than sixty locations at this point, point. Um, and some of these people have been doing it since the program started in 1992, and they've gone out to a particular spot on a stream pretty much every month for you know going on 30 years so um that's an extraordinary commitment and these people know more about these places that they visit and monitor than anybody in the universe and and isn't that a isn't that a cool thing mm -hmm. um and i'll say organizations like ours rely on volunteers that we rely on um, people to help us educate others share what they know about the natural world and what we need to do to protect it. Um, we have a terrific staff of scientists and advocates and um, educators. Uh, we're, we're almost at three dozen staff people now, which is a lot of growth for us. Um, but to do this work requires so much more than that. Um, it requires uh, dedicated volunteers and people are just live a life that is going to protect and restore the things we care about. So I, I think that's what's really important about John's films. Um, he certainly speaks to me as someone who's made this a career, but I think through through your films, you, you speak to everyone in a way that hopefully inspires them to think twice uh, before they do certain things and find ways to um, become better stewards of the environment. So I just, I, I want to thank you 
public john for for your work which i think is yeah. really important well you know we and the thing is that we make these things to share we want people to to see them and you know and get inspired by them uh do, do you think that jim you told the story about your nightly walks and your uh -huh. uh, interaction with the, with the 240 eel i mean do you think that the one possible slight silver lining of the pandemic is that it's forced people outside more i mean here i know up and down the Hudson river they've They've had to over over the months. They've had to close parks because they're too crowded. People can't get in. I, I think it absolutely has. And we we went through a period. So we have a um, a nature reserve in Hopewell Township, which is the town immediately adjacent to Princeton to the west um, near Pennington, which is a little uh, borough within the township. Um, the nature reserve is close to a thousand acres now. We've got more than. 10 miles of trails and we've seen a huge increase in the number of people that come out just to get outside to hike um, to enjoy the the time outside because they can't go to a movie theater and they can't go hang out in a coffee shop they can't go to a restaurant they can't go There's to a only library so and, long, only so long you can sit uh, on your couch and yeah. and, and, uh, but we had there was a period the uh where things were so bleak in new jersey that uh the state closed the state parks and the county closed the county parks and we decided to close it was a controversial thing we got some a uh, little bit of backlash on that but it was just because we could see what was coming at us um with these wonderful county parks around us if they were closed people were going to overwhelm us and we have at that point a very small staff working there but um so there's that's been a, a tricky thing with um the huge increase in people getting out and visiting parks, but it's kind of shined a spotlight on a lot of these state, county, local nonprofit parks um, have been a little bit overwhelmed. They don't have the infrastructure, the, the, the human resources to take care of it, but it's, I think it is a very much a, a silver lining. Yeah. And another part of that is something that Susan referenced earlier, which is the, uh, the, the our, our food system and mm -hmm. how, you know, we all are, are hopefully, uh, and but I was going to say, we're hopefully all kind of thinking more about where our food comes from, and et cetera. But I say that from a kind of privileged perspective, because I live here in, in very rural. I mean, if I go that way, I roll into the Hudson River. If I go that way, there's thousands of acres of farmland, I mean, literally three minutes from my house. So, uh, you know, it's easier for me to find a baker who uses produce from this uh, Part of part of the the region and and doesn't have as big of a carbon footprint. So I, I I think that is changing a little bit, but that doesn't speak to the eight million people who are recently unemployed or in poverty and uh, in the or the twenty five million who are unemployed and the eight million who are recently in poverty. It's harder. We, I was doing a, a conversation on on uh, online yesterday with a woman we were talking about the growth growing of grains. And she reminded me, you know, go go into a, a big grocery store, a big chain grocery store, sometime, and and walk up and down the uh, the bread aisle. And she said, "There's a clear odor in that uh, smell of of that fresh Wonder Bread, that fresh mm -hmm. that is not natural. Mm -hmm. It's not natural, and that's how most people live. So, you know, hope, hopefully this gives people a, a, an incentive to live more locally and 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 it, it, as much as possible. Um, but as I say that, I know it's tough for a lot of people living in big urban areas, especially. So let's uh, let's go to a couple questions here. And um, so uh, let's take this one. Uh, this is from Emily. She wrote, I live on Lake Carnegie, and there is a tremendous amount of recreational fishing every day. Can you talk about what they are catching and whether the fish in the lake has changed over the past 50 years or so? Mm. Jim, that one's to you. Boy, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of fish in – it's amazing. You'll go to lakes and ponds, and there's a lot of fish in there. Um, there may not be a lot of diversity of fish. Um, most likely they're catching sunfish, but there could be some largemouth bass in there. I, I, I don't know Lake Carnegie as much as perhaps I should or with the fish life. Um, but the interesting thing is there are people, um, and this is kind of a, a dicey situation. There are, there are people who um, are fishing in lakes and ponds in our area, and, and they are fishing for their sustenance. And that's kind of a, a almost invisible um subpopulation um but there are a lot of fish that the water quality 
in Lake Carnegie, like a lot of places, um, it's a mixed bag, in, particularly after a rainstorm that uh, flushes a lot of um, pollutants off our roadways, off our parking lots, off our um, lawns and farms into the rivers. So um, that's something we're always uh, concerned about is right after it rains in a lot of places, we have this, it's called polluted runoff or, or, or polluted stormwater runoff. And you can have terrible spikes of um, not just chemical pollutants uh, and nitrogen and phosphorus, but the nutrient pollutions, but bacteria levels. Um, so, you know, and this can be a, a serious health problem. Um, we've had a couple instances in the state of New Jersey not in Lake Carnegie yet, fortunately, um, something called harmful algal blooms. And this is a cyanobacteria that's become more prevalent that releases a toxin that is quite a serious thing. Um, I don't know of anyone, of any um, humans that have uh, perished from exposure to this in, in the United States, but there've been dozens of pets that have um, and I, and I, I don't know of any cases in New Jersey, but um, Florida, Texas, and a number of other places. And this problem's getting worse because of two things. What what a what a bacteria need? Well, they need nutrients. They need food. And when you heat the water bodies up, then you've kind of supercharged the growth of mm. algal blooms. So with with climate change and with this polluted stormwater runoff, we're making that problem uh, worse and worse. And in some places, it's a, it's a very serious thing indeed. Rosedale Lake, uh, which is uh, part of the Mercer County Park System um, over in Hopewell, Lawrenceville, kind of where those two towns come together, um, has had one of these harmful algal blooms. They call them HABs for short. Um, and so they've had to discontinue boating and fishing in the in the lake, which you know, again, for some people who are um, under the radar fishing for their sustenance, you know that that can become a a, a big deal for them. So, uh, Janie, I'm going to ask you if you um, put the chat back on, and I know we have a link we uh, we prepared that uh, goes to the you know, really great resources on, on your website, Jim. I mean, I encourage everybody to check out your entire you. website. And uh, so we could put that, um, Jenny, I put that in and we have two more questions we'll take and then we'll kind of wrap up. So let me just go to those. And we have a question. This is from Ping who asks, John, how can we watch Ghost Fleet today? Mm. Uh, Ghost Fleet is on uh, uh, VOD, Video On Demand. I think it's on Apple TV and YouTube and uh, uh, several others. Uh, if you just search Ghost Fleet uh, on TV, it'll, it'll send you there. And they probably want to charge you three bucks or four bucks or something. But um, oh, it. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, you know, it's one of those coming to net, Netflix. It, it's it, it's a it's an interesting one though because it's not exactly a feel-good movie. You know, it's not like a, it's not a date night movie, um, but it's a, it's it's still interesting when you when you see the stories of these guys, your jaw literally drops. You cannot believe that this mm. goes on in, in in our world today. Exactly. So, and then we uh, we have a question from oh from Kim. Kim asks, "This is Kim Dorman. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Kim." On your day off. So uh, anyway, Kim writes, thanks so much for your beautiful poems, John. You've been busy that through COVID. What's your next big project? Ah, uh, next big project. Uh, it is a, and I, Jim, you can probably uh, have had a similar experience, but we've never been busier. It's unbelievable. And one of the reasons is because a lot of big environmental groups, and NGOs and things have realized that they can't get their message in front of their public because they can't be with their public so they've turned to online videos so we've been helping them make uh you know elaborating on messages but also fundraising you know uh, and it's been <laughs> that's kind of eye-opening for some of them some of these groups that are used to putting on big annual galas and uh, spending a lot of money and then realizing oh well actually maybe we don't have to do that maybe people are just happy to stay home and send a check um so we've been doing that but our big film now for the end of this year and into next year is about sea level rise on the hudson river 
um, literally from the tip of Manhattan to, to Albany and, and the way it's affecting small communities, but also, you know, the biggest city, one of the biggest cities in, in, in the world and how they're dealing with this inevitable uh, six to 10 foot sea level rise by 2100. We have a great quote from a scientist at Lamont Doherty uh, Columbia University. You remember, the, remember when uh, Hurricane or Super Storm, Storm Sandy uh, overflowed uh, the lower Manhattan and all the water was pouring into the subway system? And he said by 2150, so 130 years from now, that kind of incident will happen twice a day, even on bright sunny days, because the sea le the levels will have risen to such a degree. So obviously we've got to, uh, to take some steps to uh, and Susan, you showed a great film uh, last year or a couple of years ago, The Managed Retreat, you know, which is, is an option. Either you have to build big walls to protect yourself. Um, De Mayor de Blasio proposed a giant U of 25 to 35 foot of land that would go around southern Manhattan. Um, here in, in, uh, in uh, you know, Ulster County in Kingston, where I, where I live, they, uh, uh, you know, they're talking about tiering the uh, uh, land around the, 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 the perimeter as kind of a sacrifice zone. They know that after X number of years, this part's gonna be gone. After X number of more years, that part's gonna be gone. So it was planned for it. So hmm. the communities around the, around, the, around the Hudson River, around New York and New Jersey, around the coast of the United States, around the world, are all grappling with this same concern. It's how do we deal with, with the inevitable? And, and the stories of, um, you know, uh, of people becoming climate refugees. We have a beautiful short film you can still watch through tomorrow called Lowland Kids, which is about a family living in Louisiana and where they live, they are going to be moved because it will no longer be possible for them to live there. It's sort of like the story, John, in the film you mentioned, Managed Retreat. Yeah. And did you show Did you show Mossville? We also have seen that Mossville too, this, this past yeah. week. Yeah, yeah, it's along those same lines. But, yeah. yeah, so you know, people are. This is happening. People are telling these stories. Which the fact that you know people are being heard and represented is a really good thing. Um, so one of the things I've mentioned in some one of the other sessions is that what we're finding, like it's always been an emphasis for us to focus on environmental justice issues from from year one. We've been doing that, and. We're seeing more films, but what I'm seeing is very interesting that there's this the lines that used to be like, well, that's a human rights story. Or like I always would have people say, well, why is that, why is that environmental? <laughs> it's like all of those things are starting to go away now because the stories about um, social justice, environmental justice, human rights, um, the rights of nature, which we have a film about tomorrow. So there's there's no defining lines between these so uh, makes for more interesting storytelling too I think so um, you can catch John he has a radio program called the Green Radio Hour there's a link to it you can listen to it's a it's a podcast it's a radio show what is it John that's uh, both yeah. it's live on the radio at 3 p.m. on Sundays on radiokingston.org or then it's archived immediately. And uh, honestly, I think the bulk of the audiences are listening to the archive, which is fine. Um, but, to our computer. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah. And Jim, uh, we could tell people to go check out your website and yeah. you have a newsletter, email newsletter you send out and how we do. So yeah, we, we actually, we've been so busy, John, as you've suggested, we, our staff have just been incredible at figuring out how to do things online. Um, we're also doing a lot of, uh, in-person programming now, although it's smaller capacity, we're doing the social distance, you've got to wear a mask if you want to come to our programs. Um, so all of this is uh, available on our website, thewatershed.org. So please come out for some outdoor, healthy, safe family adventures with our, with our terrific staff. Um, we're also looking for people to, as I mentioned earlier, volunteer. You know, we have a long-term project in front of us. We're, we're losing all of our ash trees from this little bug called the emerald ash borer. And so huge chunks of forest are dying. So we're, we're starting, we're, we're trying to plant the next generation of forest, which is a decades long challenge. Um, we've got a new program called Adopt a Plot. Um, we're looking for volunteers. We're just going to give 
put folks up modest area to, to help us restore. And that's the only way we're going to do this with a lot of volunteers. We need volunteers to help us with the, the stream monitoring and also environmental advocacy. So you can learn about all these programs on our website. Um, so we'd love to have you uh, join us for that. We send out our electronic newsletter now twice a week. Great. Um, we used to send it out once a month. We were always nervous about over emailing people, but there's just been a huge appetite for information and, and opportunity to do things, particularly outside. Hey, um, I just want to take one more question. Uh, this one, I think we'll go to Jim. So this is from Melody, who asks, um, mentions our family enjoys the films, enjoyed the films. Was wondering if the levels of pollution, which you hear about in the Hudson is going down and how that affects the fish. Well, maybe that's for you, John. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the, the, the levels of pollution in the Hudson have definitely declined since the 60s and 70s. There was a big GM plant there near the bridge in, mm -hmm. in Cherry Town where they said that you could tell the colors of the, 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 what color they were painting the cars that day because that would be the same color as the river. Yeah. So it's obviously, uh, you know, a thousand times better today. Uh, there's not the kind of... Uh, industrial dumping that there was for years and it's thanks to you know we have we're very lucky we have big environmental groups you know constant river keeper clear water you know who draw, and then uh, 300 other groups affiliated with with us rivers okay. so a lot of people with their attention focused on, on watching out for the river and cleaning it up um that said you know we have a we have a sizable issue like everywhere in the in the country and everywhere in the world with, with the sewage runoff where every time it rains the, the sewer systems overflow and so the, the, all that goes directly into the river. That's, that's probably the biggest pollution on the Hudson today, uh, which no one likes to think about and talk about. But, you know, that's a subject of a, 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 a next film as well. Uh, I, I know the title of it, but I won't say it on the, on the library. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd say we've done a pretty good job at really reducing and mostly eliminating the intentional discharge of pollutants to our rivers. But we still have these problems, the legacy pollutants, like John talked about with the old GE contaminants in the sediment in the river, um, and then the runoff from our daily lives and the overflow of sewer systems. Those are all unintentional, but huge sources of contamination that we need to address over the next decades. But, but 100,000 people get their, on the, uh, on the Hudson River, get their drinking water from the river, including all of Poughkeepsie. Um, so, you know, and they're filtered obviously, but you know, they're, they're, it is still a, a clean enough source that, uh, that they're comfortable in letting people, the tourists who visit Rhinebeck and... Uh, <laughs> well, we, we could have Jim on a program like this for two hours talking about <laughs> water here in central New Jersey. I don't think anybody wants to hear that. <laughs> but it, it's, it's really complicated. And um, so I think we're just about out of time, but I would encourage in our last minute or so for... Um, the chat is back on. People just want to pop in there and say hello and uh, say say nice word to Jim and to John. That would be nice. Can, and, Susan, can I ask one question? Yeah. Does the, does this is this conversation that we're having is this recorded and will it be available for others? Or? It is. It's actually recording and it will be available shortly after we finish. And okay. then um, you'll be able to watch it again, share the link with people. I mean, of course, I think about watching it again. I don't know. We should burn it. But no, I'm not going to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, Jim. No offense. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that's one of the, the nice features of virtual. You can watch it again and share it with exactly. people. And so, you know. Thank, thank you, Susan. Thanks to thanks to Kim for that sh that question and for all your hard work, too. Very thoughtful. Yeah. So I just want to say to everybody, we really loved uh, the films that we selected this year. And we were so disappointed at the thought that, you know, for us, it was like we put all this work in and it wasn't just like, oh, why did we do that? But we really, our goal is we want to share these films with you. You know, we, this is what we do at the library. We, we want to have materials and information and we want to share it with everybody and certainly extends to the film festival. So we're really happy we, that we got to do it. We liked this whole group of films. We often have films that we feel that the stories kind of step from one to another. So if you watch many of them, you're really getting a lot more out of it. So I just want to mention to people that this afternoon we'll be talking about Picture of His Life, which is a wonderful film. Um, I know uh, people have had an opportunity to see it all week and will be available uh, until tomorrow. But join in and we'll have the co-director, Danny Minkin, here to talk. And then um, 
We finish up our last talk is tomorrow, and that'll be at 30 p.m. Time for after the Giants game being over. Um, <laughs> we look at these things. And uh, so that we'll have the uh, filmmakers, um, Joshua and Melissa will be here to talk about their, their film. And you can learn a lot more about this growing, the evolution of this movement that is called the Rights of Nature. So um, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Thank you, thank John. You. Always, Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Jim. I Thanks hope so much. you'll take part next time we do this. Um, hope it's so. Wonderful to have you here with us today. And thank you for sharing um, the wonderful work that you're doing at the Watershed Institute. John, keep making your films and we'll keep showing you. Thank you. All See right. ya. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks again, Susan. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, John. Bye, John.